Hello everybody and welcome to the, I can't believe I'm saying this, 110th edition of the Frankenstein chat. And for those watching the video, I'm absolutely delighted and I know a lot of the people who follow us will be delighted to know that we have got Isha Asim back with us. Isha was a guest on our seventh edition and I think it's fair to say as it's done, we have had more requests for Isha to come back than any other guest. That we've had and we've had professors and various other people here people in you know very well known um much be much better known than you are but actually people just want your voice they want to hear what you've got to say so uh, welcome isha so Hi there. <laughs> uh, um how are you how are you stan um, um okay as uh, as usual there are family crises Issues happening going on. Um, but uh yeah we're we're okay Good. to go <laughs> excellent um well isha there may be one or two people though who have joined us more recently who have no idea who you are so do you want to just give us a little summary about who you are and what you do so my name is isha i'm a university student and the reason i'm here today is because i do a lot of things in terms of youth voice within manchester and nationally as well so i used to be the youth mp for manchester from 2019 to 2020 and um, yeah so I've kept in touch with doing things in youth voice so making sure young people's voices are heard in every area of society in terms of policy and in terms of activist groups as well. Wow so how active are you at uni? I'd say I am quite active um, yeah I've been elected as the vice president of the society of wow. all the societies on my university so that's pretty good. Fantastic yeah and, and, and can I I mean, you were you were a student that was looking forward to going to university probably immensely, weren't you? I mean, you had the difficulty of the was it the first year or the first the first year, I think, where you you basically had no lectures. And that must have been a terrible sort of feeling when you were probably looking forward to the cut and thrust of tutorials and things. So, I mean, how have you responded to all of that? How, how's, how's it feeling now? It's kind of surreal because I've just finished my second year of university and we're getting our results back soon. So. University is nearly over, there's only one year left, but at the same time it feels like you just started because the entire first year was all online and it was all, you know, there was no socialising at all. You couldn't even make your lectures. So even though first year was complete, it doesn't feel like you did it, but at the same time you feel like you feel proud of yourself because you've made it this far and there's only one more year left, so you might as well take all of the opportunities you can get. Yeah, yeah. I mean, does it make you feel as though you'd want to do, because I mean, there are uh no doubt for people like yourself and for many other young people there are lots of opportunities you know lots of job opportunities around at the moment but does it make you feel as though you want to do another year you know to take on a say masters or something in order to sort of try and get that extra year back to be honest i am 90 percent sure i want to pursue a masters i don't know if that's just because i missed that one year of university or i just I'm passionate about the subject, the field, but yeah, I, I definitely want to do it. It's kind of like compensation, even though I'm paying for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the sting in the tail, isn't it? I mean, that's something Stan and I never had to endure, you know, that, yeah. that side of it. Anyway, um, what Stan's given me strict instructions to make sure that we have enough time to, to chat to Isha at the end. So I'm going to cut straight to it now, Stan, and say, what's caught your eye this week? Well, for me, it's, it was a, just a, a sideline in, on a news item talking about the, the aftermath of the, of the shooting in America. Uh, I, I do think there were, there's a 500 shootings, I think, there's been in the last year. So it's not deemed as an unusual uh, event. Um, thankfully, it doesn't happen here. But the, the, result, the, the sort of result of, of people saying, well, what do we do about it? Uh, and some guys come up with, we need to build schools with high walls, no windows, one way in and fortified fences out, outside. So in other words, let's imprison our children rather than let's deal with the issue of mostly young men with an association with the school, uh, buying guns and going and shooting people. 
Mm. Surely there's a, an easier way to, to be able to narrow down those chances rather than building a school. With what, I mean, somebody responded by saying, well, you can't build one with one entrance because of fire regulation, so that's how. <laughs> um, and and the, the, the thought of children not being able to see out of windows in a school, just, it, I think that's horrendous. Mm. It's, a, it's a Victorian model, though. It is. I Victorian mean, schools were built so you couldn't see out of the windows to yeah. distract you from the board at the front. Yeah. Uh, but, I, I mean, I did a lot of, of training with head teachers on critical incidents, and obviously th those kind of things are mentioned in the uh, in the conversations. And, and my worry is that schools think they're safe. Um, and and they, they're really not, and you can't make yourself safe. You know, there was the, I, I used to say on the course that the Russia, there was a case in Russia where uh, a lot of school children were shot yeah. and the, the people with guns walked in at nine o'clock when the doors opened. So most schools, I would guess, are vulnerable at nine o'clock when mm. there's a million of parents yeah. about, yeah. It's, it's the time when you're very vulnerable. And the more you think, I'm safe, then I think the bigger the risk is. Yeah, yeah. But I don't think the answer is fortifying schools to the point of uh, nobody can get in. I think we have to have other solutions. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Because um, I remember the first Ofsted inspection I had issue was in 1994. And uh, <clears throat> um, one of the recommendations was to improve security in the grounds. And, and, uh, it was it was a site that was virtually impossible to to, to make it um, totally secure. You just couldn't make it secure because of it, 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 its location made it virtually impossible. And the issues that Stan was talking about there, yeah, we we highlighted those weaknesses, and uh, it was one of four major sort of issues that they they identified. But it was it, 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 there was no real consideration as to well how are we going to sort it. It was just saying somebody somewhere said, well you're not secure enough. Well, you know, I mean, we thought we were. If you remember, Frank, the week, the week, we, well, the, the time we inspected was Dunblane happened. Yeah, yeah. Dunblane happened while I think I was inspecting a school in Lee that week. And, uh, I mean, there was, a, there was a change in attitude because I have to say, before then, you could walk into virtually yeah, any school yeah. Uh, yeah. through a side door, through the front door, and that changed. But it worries me that schools think they're safe. Yeah. But I think, Stan, you've had issues as well. I've heard you talk here about, you know, safeguarding issues where offence wasn't high enough and this sort of stuff. You know, I mean, in effect, yeah. in effect, you know, uh, schools, you know, they, they, they really are a reflection of the society in which they're located, you know, and actually the risks yeah. that you have in particular communities, you know, that, that, that they relate to those communities, you know, um, but, uh, I, I was guilty as well. I, I re sort of made a big thing for a time during the inspection in a small Cumbrian school because there was a pond that hadn't got any kind of protection around it. And, and I mean, the head and governors and everybody was saying, these are farming kids. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a river they're over not, there. There's not, no fencing around yeah, that they're river. Not wonder, <laughs> they're not going to wander into this a pond. You know? I know, and I know. You're right, it's, it's about context as everything else is as well as uh, as safety so isha what's caught your eye this week i would say um the one thing that's caught my eye this week is the situation in sri lanka so obviously nobody is oblivious to the fact that we've got fuel rising fuel prices and i think it's really shocking and kind of disappointing to see that sri lanka they've closed their schools because the fuel crisis is that bad and I think they've extended it for another week as well. And personally, I know that you two, Frank and Stan, you're both very passionate about education, as am I. And I feel like if I had been, you know, whatever age at high school or primary school and they'd close school because of the fuels crisis, you know, you miss out so much, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of like even being with your friends, the social aspect side, even the youth voice side, but like putting that to a side for a second, the education that you need that kind of, you know, shapes you and teaches you so much about the world that we live in those children are missing out on that and because of the situation with the fuel and i think it's so disheartening yeah is it is it because people can't get to the places i mean i i, I can immediately envisage if that was the case here 
they would be teaching in parks and and things. Te teachers would go and gather children and where you know this sounds really mad now, but this is shows how old I am. When when we used to close We're schools, not shocked at all, Sam. Of, of snow. As a teacher, you you were supposed to report to the nearest school to offer your services, so that if you couldn't get to the school where you worked, you went to the nearest school to to say. I'm available as a teacher. I can I can come in. And when I was ahead, one teacher did that once, and, and she did say, "Really, all I want you to do is ring my head to say I've reported." <laughs> I don't want to stay here. Really. <laughs> I think the the thing about Sri Lanka, though, it's it's actually a, a significant breakdown in society, isn't it? There is yeah, it a, is. It's most. There is a, a uh, I, I'm not. It's not a coup, but but it's certainly there's there's um, significant unrest, you know, and this fuel crisis is on the back of an inability, I think, to pay their debts and uh, the, the government to pay their their way, and and so on top of everything else that's happening around the world, you know, it's surprising there haven't been more countries where this has been an issue. Um, bearing in mind the you know the, the 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 struggles that there must be in order to to keep an economy, you know, a government a, a economy for a country afloat, you know. Um, but yeah, it made me think, though, as I said before, about, you know, the the, the situation in Afghanistan where, you know, you, you're, you've got girls that are unable to to go to school now, even though there were it suggested that they that wasn't going to happen, you know, but um, but it, it is happening and how that must feel, because this isn't just a temporary issue, is it in Afghanistan? This is a no, this is a you know it feels a permanent problem. Um, but this is the you know there's an opportunity now because Afghan is is struggling as well as a country is to is to negotiate and those kind of things mm. should be at the top of the negotiating mm. level that that you know all children must attend school. You know that that's our starting point. And if you want if you want any help from the other nations, that's your starting point. Yeah. But don't you think I mean. We're just pretty complacent about what's on offer, aren't we, in the UK? You know, yeah. we think, well, we get, we, you know, I, I've got grandchildren, two of my children are teachers, you know, they, they rock up, they do their bit, you know, the kids think, well, school's on tomorrow, you know, it's, and the quality of it is, I think, phenomenal, you know, um, I'm just in awe of some of the experiences and the way that some of the, the teachers treat the grandchildren you know the stuff that they learn and it's just amazing you know but actually you do get a bit blasé about it because that, isn't that what it's meant to be like you know and then when you have it lost you lose it in such a way say in Sri Lanka it does it does make you think as as lockdown did you know about how finely balanced all of this is you know and how much the the school is is actually you know the center of so much that's good for young people uh, to lose that um, simply because the government can't sort itself out. I mean, I suspect it's much more complicated than that. But yeah, that's the way I suspect many of the Sri Lankans will be viewing it. You know. Um, but anyway, what's caught my eye this week is um, something happened today. Um, so uh, the Children's Commissioner Rachel De Souza, um, who was a, C uh, a CEO of a multi academy trust. Uh, was appointed uh, children's commissioner, I think, last year, and uh, um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not. I'm saying this now. I think for the first time, I applied to go on the children's commissioner's board, um, but I was unsuccessful. Um, and, and I, I'd like it, Isha. You look surprised that you know I wouldn't get. <laughs> but actually, the thing that was most surprising is that even though I'd applied, I didn't. I, my application wasn't even acknowledged. And uh, when I uh, asked if I could have details as to why I hadn't been appointed. Not that I, you know, I have no problem in them choosing somebody else. I, I was really disappointed with the, you know, the the sort of feedback I got, bearing in mind that, you know, that I, I didn't even know whether to receive the application or not, you know. Um, so I put that to one side because I thought that was pretty bad. <laughs> it's not bitter and twisted no, at I'm all. Not, I'm yeah. not. But the thing is, is that, <laughs> but the thing for me, though, is that uh, Rachel has um, either applied for I think that's probably pushing it, but um, uh, uh, for a director role of a new in, a new organisation called the National Institute of Teaching, and uh, we won't go into the detail of it. Those of you involved in education will know precisely what that's about. But but the thing for me is more around 
the children's commissioner is a really important role because it's meant to be the voice of children and young people, particularly the most vulnerable, that are actually willing to speak truth to power. And I think there's a real concern I have about people in those positions taking up what in effect are quasi government positions um, that by doing so lose, make people feel as though they've lost their impartiality. You know, and actually I think that there is a point at which, you know, you need to work with government um, in order to try and get the best you can, including resources and focus and all that. But actually, I, I think that you can, you do need to do that, but you also need to have that distance. And I'm, I think this, this appointment, I think is quite worrying in terms of potential conflicts of interest that might result from this. So, you know, if, for example, um, this is this institu institute is is meant to be a significant pillar in how teachers are taught how to teach, you know, how they are trained, how they're educated, how they're developed. And the focus that they put on this, you know, will have a bearing on how successful it addresses future teachers are at addressing the needs of the most vulnerable. And I think that if they're not successful in that, then actually that's just creating problems for the director who's meant to be looking after those who are the most vulnerable. So you can see how this is all getting very twisted and, and why in a way this is not, I think, a good a good appointment. And no, no, no not saying that Rachel D'Souza isn't a capable person, but this is more around why these sorts of roles I don't think should be engulfing themselves or in, uh, in in sort of other government matters and they need to be an independent voice. And I think there's a potential here for that independence to be lost. So yeah, that was my uh, my thing for today. Um, so um, I think I'm interested, Isha, in what you're doing because I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, sort of following every minute of your life, but I do know that you, you, you went to Finland recently. So I want you to talk a little bit about your experience in Finland and why was it that of all the young people in this country that you were one of the people that was chosen to go and to represent young people out there at a major international conference? So essentially I went to Finland for the Eurocities mentoring program. So there's four UK cities that are participating. I think it's Glasgow, Leeds, Manchester and London. And with Manchester, the way they did it was um, our mentoring program was it had a few issues in terms of how it kicked off the ground, in terms of who ran it and who was involved in it. So it ended up just going was to that so was that local the politics? The program is, is that, just, that... just local council politics, just nothing <laughs> too interesting, but you know. <laughs> but um, with the program, the issue with the program is that. The youth Council is technically 11 to 18, even though I'm still part of it in an informal kind of capacity. And the actual program is 18 to 30. So they struggle because oh. not everyone can do the program. You have to be over 18. And me, my friend, and another girl in Youth Council, we're all over 18. So then they chose the three of us to, to be involved in this program. So by, by default, essentially, we ended up being selected. So we took part in the program. We met with one of the exec members of the council. So we're the mentors, and we teach that exec member, the mentee, about what we want to see in the future in Manchester. So in 20, 30 years' time, what needs to be in the city, what changes do we want? Otherwise, young people aren't going to want to stay in the city and provide. So that's a pro that's a program that's happening all across like Europe. So it's quite phenomenal when you think about it in those terms, because when you have the meetings, you just think it's you and your friends and you know the council member, and it's just Manchester, but it's actually much more widened than that. So obviously we had our meetings with the councillor and for some reason with Eurocities, they only allowed one delegate from each like area so from Manchester from Leeds whoever and um our chosen delegate was my friend um who's also the youth member of parliament for Manchester so she was going to go but the thing is the conference was in June and both my friends who were 18 they had a level exams right. so I was the only person by default who was uh, left over but it's always I it, finished university yeah but it's, it's always about being in the right place at the right time with the right skill set you yeah, know yeah I mean? because Honestly, like I wasn't supposed to go. I was the backup option. Otherwise, Manchester would have sent nobody. So I said to them, I I'm available. I can go. And then they took me. So it was just me and a youth worker from the council. And we went to Finland and 
had an amazing time. Um, really? I think it was about three days long and I got to meet delegates from all over Europe who were doing the exact same program, who were like really passionate about Youth Voice. And for me, it was very interesting in terms of finding out how Youth Voice operates. So you're obviously used to Manchester. We have a youth council. We have Youth Voice to an extent. But for example, in like Finland, in Espo, where we went to, their youth councillors get paid for their time, which is something right. that Manchester UK doesn't have. It's so interesting because I know that Andrew Spate in Blackpool, who was a um youth parliament member he's he's now i mean it's, it's terrible he's 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 sort of like had to retire because he's too old i think um yeah. but he's been drawn into council work as uh, and he he has joined our uh, education improvement board as a youth voice for that board so that we we have a youth voice in it you know and um but actually um the council are paying him for his for his work and which is focused purely on youth voice and actually, he does get paid for attending our meetings. So, you know, in a way, it's, it's fantastic that a small little town like that can actually, you know, and I think it's probably because um, Andrew's very, very good at at getting to the local politicians, you know, whether councillors or MPs, you know, that I think he's really sort of feathered his nest quite nicely there. Um, so, uh, yeah, sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to give a shout out for Andrew because no, he's, yeah, he's great. Andrew, I like Andrew. I've met him a few times. He was, I think we were NYPs as well at the same time. You were. So, um, yeah, he did a few things as well with the steering group with Youth Focus Northwest, some more regional work, which is very interesting. So, what, what sorry yeah. to cut you off there, but so what did you actually talk about? What did you come up with when you were in Finland? So, essentially, we we went to the conference and there was a program set out and everything and we had a couple of sessions where we as young people had to feedback what our experiences of the program were and then more importantly we had to set forward five recommendations so these recommendations would be given to Eurocity's president um dario nadella who's the mayor of florence and officially we presented them on stage um and it took us a lot of time to come up with the recommendations because you know, you both know what I'm like, and it's like 22 of me. So there's 22 people <laughs> with all their opinions, all of their... And, if, and, 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 and you only had three days. You only had three days. And, exactly. And you add into the mix, not everyone speaks English as a first language. <laughs> so things can be lost in translation. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, it was it was intense but we actually we managed to do it and we actually added six recommendations in the end and i was lucky enough so we, we also had a panel while we were there and um on the first day when we all met each other we had to put four people for the panel even though we didn't know each other that well and i put myself forward and a few other people did and then i ended up being on the panel so that was okay we talked about youth voice then the last day when we did the recommendations i said oh i shouldn't go because i've already had time so someone else should do it and then 10 minutes before we go on stage uh, one of my colleagues turns around and goes, you're going to do the recommendations. Oh, and I said, wow. how am I supposed to do it? But he went on stage with me, but then I had to do the entire thing. And the thing wow. is, obviously, I, ha I had to speak very slowly, like clearly. And obviously, when we've got these six recommendations, because everyone thought we had five. So that was like the, our trick, our ace. So we all came onto stage. I had I actually went against them and had six recommendations. I had to like explain them in detail off the cuff. It was it was very very stressful, but it was it was very worthwhile. Exhilarating. And at the same time, exactly. At yeah. the same time, the end of the conference, we we all couldn't stay because our flights. So my flight was at four o'clock, and the conference I was still there at one o'clock so my youth worker said to me we have to leave at one o'clock and then so when when it was coming up to my time I said I can't leave early because they overran and I said I can't leave early I'm presenting the recommendations oh. so this this is like what this is the entire point of the conference right so while I was doing my speech on stage she was in the corner of my eye going quickly 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 even though I naturally talk fast so <laughs> but it was it was such a it was very great experience it was very stressful but I really enjoyed it but, but what were those recommendations recommendations what, 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 I'm not um, expecting you to remember them all but what are the ones that stick in your head you know in terms of there's there's one we created about um having a youth policy so a compulsory policy in local cities which means that you have to consult young people on decisions that involve them so for example if you're going to build like a house or something in a certain area like a plot then you've got to consult young people if it's going to affect them because in terms of like you know if they're going to like buy it in the future or like you know have an it's going to obstruct their kind of you know way of life things mm. like that there's also another one which is quite interesting about creating a Eurocities youth department so making sure that 
for me, what, what I thought was quite, it was disappointing and it, a good thing is at the same time that like, so in Finland, they get paid the youth councillors, which is like better than the UK. But at the same time, there's places in Germany, I think it was Chemnitz, I can't remember what, what city it was. There were some cities in Germany, they don't have um, youth councils at all. There's nothing oh, there. Right. So for me, at least, okay, we don't get paid, but we have a structure. So in having a Eurocities youth department, you'd make sure everyone's kind of at least on the same base level that young people have an outlet, a platform to convey their views. Yeah, wow. I mean, also um, proving that I sort of at least follow you on Twitter, is that you were comparing comparing a Manchester youth event, weren't you, recently? Um, I mean, I, I'm just thinking, comparing this event, you know, like you must have, you've always been a very confident young woman. I mean, how did that feel? You know, I mean, I suppose it was a doddle, was it, compared to having no preparation for the Finland event? But I mean, how did, what were you, what were you doing there? Yeah, so that was um, another uh, opportunity related to the Youth Council in a way that um, they were looking for someone. It was called the Manchester Achievement Awards 2022, and it's an award ceremony specifically for like young carers or people who like in care. And it was a very important like situation and ceremony and they were looking for a host and I was available. So I offered to host, help wow. host the event for them. And it was phenomenal. It was very interesting. And I, I really liked it in particular because a lot of the work I do obviously it includes young people but like not necessarily like young carers so that was a demographic that I quite enjoyed working with and listening to because they everyone got awards it was like there were two sessions of it so the morning was like primary school children and then this the even the afternoon was like more um secondary school children and I really enjoyed like the the differences between like working with primary school kids and working with secondary school kids but at the same time they'd also tell you oh you know Isha's getting an award today because she's done she's um, leading the youth council in her school and everyone's really proud of her and it was really nice to hear that despite people's backgrounds they were still making such big impacts within their schools so I really enjoyed that especially you know the Lord Mayor Donna Ludford Yes, she attended. She oh, attended, wow. and she's wow. she's a care leaver herself. She was in care her, her whole life until eighteen, and um, and it was quite emotional because she delivered a speech about you know I'm from care and now I'm like the Lord Mayor of Manchester. So it was really nice to see that kind of yeah, story and connect with those young people. Yeah, um, young carers is always I think for me now is is a real weak point in my understanding when I was uh, directly in education. And it was only as a governor when uh, one of the councillors, we were talking about children who, who were frequently late and what was the school doing about it? And she just said, have you asked any of them if they are carers? And it was, what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know. Nobody, nobody thought of that as a, as a reason. And I thought <laughs> then throughout my education, career especially when I was ahead that never crossed my mind and it really should have done isn't it doesn't that make the case then for that range of voices you know being heard being yeah. drawn from a range of backgrounds you know and not all being sort of like in 67 years of age and white former head teacher you know that sort of stuff is it's probably a place well, for some of that you know but huh it's probably up 66, not 67. <laughs> just, <laughs> yeah, they, they just fly past when he gets to my age. But, but the thing is, is that it, it, you know, it's so important. And, and actually having youthful voices on governing bodies, you know, and trust boards, you know, that's, that's, I think there is so much to be gained from that. Um, but it's so difficult to get people to sit through three hours of boring meetings yeah. you know and and you know and to so make sure they're not just a token because yeah. my big objection was was dragging young people into meetings that didn't consider their views really um that there was nothing that they were were engaged with but but everyone could say oh yes we we have yeah, some yeah. representation yeah. from young people and i it's i just really felt for, for yeah. in the uh, children's hubs when they were doing that because they just what well there wasn't an area of, of um discussion where they kind of took the chair and, and they led the discussion they were just quite often just two people who were in the meeting which yeah 
It's a waste That's of That's something we, we commonly discuss. Um, you notice it more the more youth related things you do and even with Eurocities I had a brilliant time it was amazing when I, I say I wouldn't change it as and I would because we had a lot of feedback as delegates we actually all met up after it was on zoom it took like a long time to arrange but you know and we talked about and I said it at the panel and like people were applauding me and it's like but it wasn't the point it's not to like applaud and like say oh well done but I was talking about how you know we talk about um we're going to change this for young people. We're going to listen to you, but there's never any tangible action that follows. Mm -hmm. And even with Eurocities, before I went on stage and did my panel, one of my colleagues was saying to me, you know, can you mention that, that the, the Eurocities, like the conference in general, these kinds of summits and things like that happen because it's, it, to an element, it is performative. It's saying, oh, look, we've got these 22 delegates. These are brilliant young people. And they, they've they been given their own time to create recommendations. And that's why we kind of kicked back a little bit and said, we're going to actually have six recommendations. And we even, I don't know why we said this at the time, but we said that we're going to create a report six months from the conference to enforce the recommendations and make sure like our views are being heard, which is obviously phenomenal and amazing. But now we have to actually write the report <laughs> we're going to write. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I think um, one of the, it's, I'm trying to bring something in here now because I'm conscious I was asked, uh, somebody asked me whether or not uh, I would strike if I was a teacher. And it's a bit, it's topical at the moment. Um, and I have to say, I haven't, I've never, uh, I've never gone on strike um, as a teacher. Um, but actually it made me think about, you know, th here thinking about that. And you led a strike action, didn't you, with students and uh i don't know if you want to just whether what where are we with that because that that proved to be a highly successful uh, action in terms of getting people to support you but actually there would be probably some people might say well how what is it what's it achieved so far you know um yeah do you want to just say a little so, bit about that yeah of course and um, so i think it was 2019 i think i was in college and you know Greta Thunberg had really kicked off and inspired the school strike movement for climate change and I went to one of the school strikes in Manchester and we started up the Manchester Youth Strike Movement and um, the biggest strike we had was in September 2019 and we had like thousands of people come all different generations as well not just young I'm, people. I'm just thinking about that, that you've got a responsibility for caring for those people as well haven't you you know yeah, you, yeah. you know, it's, it's you that have brought them together I mean did that bear heavy on on you and the other organizers or was it just you were just stuns that there were thousands of young people in this in this think, square yeah i think you do understand how big a responsibility it is you know because obviously when you're organizing the strike and if you're anticipating it's going to be a large one especially if you because there's certain days where they do like global strikes so if you choose one of those days you know it's going to be one where loads of people will come because everyone's aware of it as opposed to like a local one and um when we did the september strike we had thousands of people but there's like a ton of preparation that went into that so right, who's going right. to organize having a stage who's going to liaise with the police who's going to make sure we've got if we're going to march have you got a route planned out in advance you know all those things that you don't necessarily think about when you join but when you're organizing everything has to be checked <laughs> like when we had our first strike back after covid um i had i i was on like um covid duty so i had like hand sanitizers wipes because people like to obviously use a microphone and speak to each other but at the same time with covid i was like okay we'll do it but every time someone speaks i have to make sure i wipe it and everything and everyone's yeah, yeah. got hand gel so it's about making sure that you you do obviously have that responsibility to people but at the end of the day they're also responsible for themselves to an extent you know yeah so what the impact what impact are they still going on uh or has covid sort of seen an end to those or and do you feel as though they've had much impact? Any impact? A lot of impact? I think it's really interesting. I think um, in terms of our Manchester one, it's kind of um, like in a break at the minute because a lot of people who organised it, it depends on what people are doing. And obviously in every organisation, if you don't have those key people, it tends <laughs> to fall apart. Yeah. And um, I think in terms of the impact it made, having the strikes that year, that was the same year we got the carbon neutral target for Manchester for 2038. So I would say that definitely helped influence that. So that for me is like quite a massive sign, even if the council's not necessarily taking steps to reach that target, that target is <laughs> well, somehow in place. Because I, heard Andy, I heard Andy Burnham um, restate that commitment um, to delegates from uh, the Swiss embassy about two weeks ago and uh, was actually very clear that that target needs to be brought forward as well you know that that 
the target is too far off that we can do better than that. So, you know, I think that making that pledge, which actually is as much to Swiss businesses who might want to um, relocate in the greater Manchester area, one of those factors would be wanting that agenda to be at the forefront of the city in order that they could wrap themselves around the goodness that there is within that, you know? Um, so I think it was quite significant that he made that statement in front of sort of major politicians, both in from Britain and, and, and from Switzerland. Yeah. So oh, you may yeah. well have... I was just going to say, what are you actually studying at uni apart from radicalism and, and yeah, activism? And activism. <laughs> is, is there a degree in that now? <laughs> is, is a... I mean, I don't think so. <laughs> if there's a master's, you'll know where I'll be then. <laughs> Yeah, I'm studying law currently. Yeah. So you still the... you still hoping to be a, bar a barrister? That's still. Hopefully, um, I'll see what happens. I mean, I've always been very interested in politics from like a young age, from yeah. like primary school, secondary school. It's always been politics for me, but I'll have to see what happens. You know, I think it's it's I think it's kind of a strange place to be in because when you're at my age, just before university ends, everyone's like, you've got the world at your feet, there's so many job opportunities, you can be anything you want, but at the same time, you're looking around and thinking, you know, there's lots of things going on in America, there's lots of things going on here with fuel prices, with Ukraine, and it kind of sometimes feels like there's not much hope out there, and what if there's not enough funding to do the things I want to do, and, you know, I think you're in that middle where people are telling you it's supposed to be great, but it doesn't always necessarily correlate with how you feel, so, you know. Yeah. Well, I, I think uh, I just get, I, I feel you, you sort of ooze sort of optimism, Isha. So I suppose for, for somebody of my age, was it 66, 67, 66? Yeah, it's, <laughs> lovely to, it's lovely to hear that sort of level of sort of uh, awareness and, and, and somebody, um, the, a younger gen generation, wanting to make the difference that I think I felt I wanted to make when I became a teacher, not not in any way. Uh, I don't think I was anywhere near as as prepared for for life in the way that you are and, and seeing societal issues in the way that you're seeing them. You know, I, 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 I was just about trying to make sure that some primary school kids had a better day today than they had perhaps last time, you know. But I think yours, it's just been a, a, an absolute pleasure listening to you chatting about the stuff that you do. Um, I can understand why people want to hear your voice. So um, we have this new slot though, don't we, Stan? Yes. Well, route, well it's, is it 110 this episode? Yes, it is. <laughs> so it's 101 in 110. Yeah. So when we did uh, the 101 edition, we had two eminent, uh, highly eminent, uh, educationalists um, and it was the 101st edition so they they dropped into room 101 uh, I can't remember what they were now but since then we've had guests who have offered something for room 101 I don't know if you've had a chance to think about it but if you could put something or someone or whatever an event into room 101 what would it be oh that's quite interesting um I think controversial but <laughs> go for it. in terms yeah. of like <laughs> it's just I, I was in a meeting as well recently I'm saying meeting because it's, it I don't want to like pinpoint exactly but uh, yeah. and it's um it was about young people again talking to like leaders and talking about their issues and things that they care about and I was there the entire time and my role was to facilitate not necessarily be involved with it but it just made me so angry being there for an hour because it felt like all these young people have all these inspiring ideas and those leaders say the same thing to them again and again they don't offer anything new so i'd say for me it just it would just be the, the politicians the leaders ironically yeah i just feel like i don't know like and i i'm I know you guys have been here much longer than me, but then at 20, I'm so frustrated and annoyed. It feels like I'm going to the same things and we're having the same conversations year after year and nothing's changing. And I don't understand why nobody sees it the same way, apart from people I talk to who are my friends. I, I think it's very perceptive though, isn't it, Stan, that even at your age of 20, that you're working out that this is the same old, same old, same old, same yeah. old, you know? Um, but, and I think we can see that. Um, and we've got all these years of experience but the fact that you're seeing that you know truth to power and all that you know if if you know call it out 
you're good at calling it out in a nice way so just keep <laughs> calling it out and it's also to make sure changes for the right reasons because mm. I, I i probably the older i get the more i'm i'm seeing things that are changing that are disappointing me from from when i was younger uh, and especially at the moment political change for reasons that aren't clear certainly don't appear to be for the the bettering of the country or for the bettering of people's lives and and that's what i think we should be about and he, the phrase used before frank it's it's almost you know let's make each day a little bit better than the day before and if we're all trying to do that maybe it w yeah. there would be some hope for uh, for the younger generation well and on that note that seems a good <laughs> time to finish isn't it so isha thank you ever so much and uh it's been a, an absolute pleasure you know, hearing you talk about the work that you're doing. And uh, I find it inspirational um, to see that, you know, an, an education service and, and the experiences you've had, you know, have enabled you to, to take these positions and to to sort of lead in such a positive way for, for young people. So uh, well done to all those teachers that taught you, to your parents, everything else that's connected with you. Just go for it, girl. Just go for it um so for those um we've we are on a monday night this is quite a, a slightly late recording um but our next uh recording will be on friday and we have uh uh, uh mina wood a uh, former hmi who is a, a real activist in terms of education you know so she she really does call it out when you know she, she's not convinced that a lot of the stuff the government's doing at the moment is right in education and she's more than happy to to let people know about it. So I'm really looking forward to having Mina on with us on uh, on Friday. So until then, it's uh, it's goodbye from all of us, and uh, thank you for listening and for for watching. And uh, thank you once again, Isha. <laughs>